Hello, everyone. My name is Erin Norton. I'm the Associate Director of the Midwest Grape and Wine Industry Institute that's based here at Iowa State University. This presentation is a repeat presentation of one that um, we did on April 3rd, 2023. Uh, we tried to record that, but unfortunately the recording, we had some technical difficulties. So this is uh, a repeat of that presentation. Um, and uh, there's many people that were interested in in the content, so hopefully you can find that um, it should be posted to our YouTube page. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out um, afterwards. So this presentation is covering uh, acetic acid, and so just a bit of background actually um, for. People that aren't watching or that are watching this presentation and aren't familiar with um, the kind of grape growing and winemaking we're doing here in Iowa and the Midwest. So we grow um, hybrid varieties, interspecific hybrid varieties that have been bred specifically for our cold uh, temperatures. A lot of them do have some good disease resistance as well. And so our industry has been um, around for about uh, just over 20 years. Uh, because of the release of some of these hybrids um, uh, at that time period. And so um, we've been constantly uh, trying to improve quality over those 20 years. And uh, some of the reoccurring issues that we see uh, as since we have a service lab here at the Institute um, and we do have samples coming in from wineries, uh, a couple of, of issues that we are uh, constantly seeing are things dealing uh, leading or problems from uh, oxidation or acetic acid. Um, and so oxidation, I think we've uh, we've worked really hard in the past couple of years at trying to um, give winemakers resources on how to uh, improve um, their faults that occur due to oxidation and you know techniques and, and winemaking protocols. So I think we're doing a pretty good job. We're starting to see uh, oxidation being handled in a pretty good way. Um, acetic acid though and volatile acidity is something we're still seeing quite often. This is something all winemakers uh, I think have issues with, not just hybrid uh, winemakers, Midwest winemakers. And so I wanted to go through where does, where does acetic acid come from? How can we prevent it? Remediation is really, really challenging. Um, so we really need to work on the prevention side of it. And then how do you actually test for it? Because I know that that's a, a challenge for us and a lot of our wineries are quite small. So wanted to, to dip into how to actually measure acetic acid. So what is acetic acid? It's a small organic acid. Um, you can see the, the chemical structure over here, so C2H4O2, um, with a molecular, we molecular weight of only 60 grams per mole. Really tiny little, um, tiny little molecule. Uh, vinegar, just to give you, you know, an idea, perspective, vinegar is typically 4 to 8 percent acetic acid. Um, some distilled white vinegars that you might use for cleaning uh, do can be stronger than that, but most of the vinegars that we consume um, are between four and 8%. Uh, acetic acid is a component of volatile acidity. So a lot of times um, at the Institute, we end up using the two interchangeably um, when we're talking about volatile acidity and the fault that is associated with that. Um, and we usually attribute the bulk of that to acetic acid up to, you know, between 90 and 95% of volatile acidity is due to acetic acid. There are some other acids that are present um, when you distill wine um, and, and contribute to volatile acidity. And another component is ethyl acetate. So these are the two components of, of volatile acidity that we the two major components, but obviously, like I said, the major component is acetic acid, and that smells like vinegar. Ethyl acetate, on the other hand, smells usually like nail polish. Um, it's the solvent that they um, that they use in nail polish that dries um, and, and is removed as the nail polish dries. So just to give you an idea, acetic acid 
threshold in wine. So when do people start to begin to smell acetic acid? So a threshold is when 50% of the population can smell. So that's the definition there. But the threshold for acetic acid in wine is about 0.8 grams per liter or 800 ppm. Um, and for ethyl acetate, it's quite a bit lower at 0.1 grams per liter or 100 ppm. Now, under the uh, threshold, if you can't actually smell acetic acid, but you do know it's present, a lot of times what acetic acid can be doing is helping to lift the other aromas out of the wine. And so um, it's not always, if it's kept in check, um, a, a small amount of acetic acid in your wine, which is always going to be there, and I'll get to that, but a small amount of acetic acid in your wine that's underneath the threshold level is not a bad thing. It is, um, it can help to lift some other aromas out of the wine and, and make your wine um, have some complexity to it. So the reason that I think acetic acid is, um, is something we need to talk about and something we really need to get under control is it is a component of a fault. There also are legal limits set by the TTB for acetic acid. So in white wine, the limit is 1.2 grams per liter. So well above the odor threshold. And in red wine, it's 1.4 grams per liter. So red wine is a little more complex. There's more um, stuff in there. And so uh, the, the legal limit is pushed a little bit more. And, and so the, the TTB is trying to, um, to tell winemakers that at these limits, this is what they feel is a quality wine or, and um, these are the legal limits that they have actually set. Now, I have never heard of anyone being um, audited for their acetic acid, but you know, the, the TTB reserves the right to do that. And so um, I encourage everyone to try and fall under these uh, legal limits. So just a reminder on some acid chemistry, a lot of winemaking is really based on acid-base chemistry. And so if you have a really good foundation in acid-base chemistry, um, a, a lot of things that are going on in your wine are gonna be easier to understand. Um, SO2, for example, adding sulfur dioxide to your wine and using it as a um, antimicrobial and antioxidant, a lot of the reactions that SO2 can can undergo in your wine are acid base um, chemistry. So just a, a little plug for for maybe reviewing some acid base chemistry, some first year or high school chemistry. So as you can see here, we've got um, we've got acetic acid on the uh, oops, I'm gonna try and get a laser pointer here. There we go. Got acetic acid on the left hand side of this equation. We've got water and the equilibrium that we're seeing is the equilibrium between acetic acid donating its acidic hydrogen, okay, to water and becoming an acetate ion, okay, and then the water would become a hydronium ion. And this is in equilibrium, so there is a likelihood of uh, having all of these species in wine okay and this is um you can you can make one of these reaction uh one of these uh equations here for any acid base um reaction so they you can see under here the pka of acetic acid is 4.76 so what does that mean pka is the definition of pka is it's the ph the ph level where you have an equal amount of this form of the acid, the fully uh, protonated form, okay? It's got all its, um, all its hydrogens. So that is an equal, uh, or sorry, equal concentration to the um, deprotonated or the ion form, okay, on this side. When these two things are in equal concentration, that's the, P the pH, at where those are at equal concentration, that's the pKa, okay? That's the definition. So for acetic acid, the species of acetic acid and acetate ion are at equal concentrations at the um, pKa. So um, just to give you another example of that, because I think pKa's are, are important, but not always um, 
totally straightforward to understand. The pKa values for tartaric acid, which is this little guy over here, which we have a lot of in wine. We've got two acidic hydrogens on tartaric acid. We've got one here on the right, or sorry, left-hand side here. This is a carboxylic acid group. So we've got this acidic hydrogen. We've got one all the way to the right over here. Okay, these two in the middle, these OH groups are just hydroxyl groups. They're not acidic groups. Okay, so we have two carboxylic acid groups on the left and the right. And so the two um, pK, so there's two pKa's for tartaric acid because there are two acidic hydrogens. So the first pKa, and it doesn't matter which one belongs to which in this picture, essentially they're the same. So the first one though is at 2.98, okay? And then the second pKa where the um, second hydrogen will be pulled off, acidic hydrogen can be lost, is at 4.34, okay? So in, the, in terms of wine, um, you can, you can imagine what form tartaric acid might be in. So going back to acetic acid, if wine is typically at a pH between three and four, what form is acetic acid most likely to be in? Which side of the equation? So we're well under, between three and four, we're well under this pKa of 4.76. So because of that, the pH is below that, and, and we are going to be more on the acetic acid side, okay? You're gonna have mostly, the majority of your acetic acid will be fully protonated or fully um, hydrogenated, if uh, that's not quite the right term, but all the hydrogens, the acidic hydrogen is attached to the molecule, okay? So moving on, let's get back to acetic acid. Where does it come from? So the origins in wine, three main time points that we're going to see acetic acid in wine. It can come in on the grapes, okay? Um, it can develop during fermentation. It will develop during fermentation, or it can develop after fermentation by spoilage microorganisms. So let's walk through this just quickly. So grapes, damaged grapes on the vines. Once a grape has a cut on it, a, a hole, um, you know, a bee got in there or a, a bird got in there and pecked a hole, you will start to promote the bacteria and yeast that naturally live on the surface of the grape to produce or, or to start fermenting those sugars. And instead of ethanol, in the presence of oxygen, those um, spoilage microorganisms as well, they're not our, um, necessarily our, our good Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the spoilage organisms that are there, the yeast and the bacteria, will start to make acetic acid. And I'm sure many of you have walked your vineyard at some point or another, you see a damaged, um, a damaged cluster, it smells like acetic acid. You do not wanna be making fruit with um, fruit that smells already like acetic acid. Chances are, if you can smell it, remember, the concentration is gonna be quite high. So um, harvested fruit should not smell like acetic acid. Um, it may be something to discuss with your grower. If you're a winery, you might want to um, make sure that your growers are not bringing you damaged fruit. Um, it could be something that you write into a, a grower winery contract that, you know, that um, acetic acid levels need to be in check. Um, another thing that you may want to do is, you know, you could spray hand harvested fruit. So if you aren't going to use the fruit right away, you might spray your hand harvested fruit. If you're going to put it in a cooler for a couple days um, before processing it, maybe spray it with a, a sulfur dioxide solution to protect that fruit. Um, again, that's to keep your uh, antimicrobial, antioxidant, keep those um, sorts of processes away and, um, and, and protect your clean fruit. Um, you can also, if you're machine harvesting, you can add SO2 and maybe uh, a way that you might want to do that is into the bottom of your bin when you're starting to pick um, and, and filling up your bin. And that way you'll have some SO2 protection um, on those grapes, um, especially with machine harvested because you get a lot of broken fruit, obviously, when you, uh, when you harvest that. Okay, so grapes, we want clean fruit. We want it not smelling of acetic acid at the juice phase. 
Fermentation, fermentation yeast. So our Saccharomyces cerevisiae and potentially our malolactic fermentation bacteria as well, they are going to produce acetic acid. It's guaranteed, okay? They're stressed out, especially at the very beginning of the fermentation and probably near the end of the fermentation. They are put into a stressful environment. At the beginning, it's this high sugar environment. And that sounds great, but it, it, it does stress out the yeast until they get their machinery going, their um, molecular machinery going to, uh, or cellular machinery, I should say, to intake this sugar and start converting it into alcohol. And then at the end, they are in a high alcohol solution. And so that's very stressful for them as well. So they are going to produce acetic acid. And so you can always count on about 0.1 to 0.4 grams per liter of acetic acid being produced. That's normal, totally normal to see acetic acid go up during fermentation. So you can imagine if you had uh, damaged fruit that came in plus your fermentation yeast making acetic acid, you really wanna be in check with your fruit, right? Because you know you're already gonna have an increase with fermentation yeast. And we just, it's just something that we can't get away from. So use clean fruit. And then lastly, spoilage microorganisms. So you've gone through, you've made nice, clean wine. You're doing whatever other processes you need to do, whether it's filtering, fining, um, and things like that, barrel aging, things like that. We can have spoilage microorganisms in our winery. Now we want to try to avoid that, obviously, but these spoilage microorganisms, um, such as film yeast, okay, uh, could, get into our tanks if we've got a good you know a good amount of headspace we could ha see film yeast start to develop and the other thing i wanted to say about um spoilage microorganisms is chances are if you've got something that's doing um for example i've used britannomyces here britannomyces is making four ethyl glycol four ethyl phenol making things that smell like manure and band-aid and medicinal and smoky and and things like that that spoilage microorganism is not only doing those the, making those bad compounds it's also making acetic acid as well okay so a lot of our spoilage microorganisms are doing something else they they're metabolizing something in the grapes to something we don't want and acetic acid okay so that is something to um, try and keep in check is uh because these for, for multiple reasons, we want to keep these spoilage microorganisms in check, and I'll talk about how we can how we can do that. Okay, there we can also have chemical oxidation um, of ethanol happening, and um, so the overall oxidation of ethanol. Step one could be the conversion of ethanol to acetaldehyde. Okay, and so how can that happen? This first reaction step here. It could be fast by a microorganism. And I know I said that we're talking about chemical oxidation. Um, and, and we'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that. But um, it could be fast by a, a microorganism like acetobacter. We could go from ethanol to acetaldehyde, or it could be slow by just a chemical oxidation reaction. And usually these chemical methods are slow. But then this second step of acetaldehyde to acetic acid is typically going to be slow. And, um, and probably see it, you know, these kinds of chemical oxidation reactions are going to be happening probably in bottle during long-term storage. So if your wine um is going to be stored for a long time or you're meaning to age it just be aware that this is possible to have um, oxidation of um, ethanol into acetic acid small amounts yes but it, it will it will occur okay so how can we prevent acetic acid from getting into um from increasing in our wine, okay? We're always already, always gonna have some during the from the fermentation. So how do we prevent all the other things from happening? Check your fruit in the field and upon receival, okay? Make sure that your fruit is in good condition, doesn't smell, and um, you may wanna check uh, analysis, do analysis at this time. Routine analysis, and I'll talk about in a second, I'll talk about the um, time points that I would analyze for. Evaluate, 
once your wine is made, you should have some sort of tasting program where you're checking your wine on a monthly, um, depends on, on the size of your winery and the styles of wine you're making and, and, and things like that. But you should be evaluating your wine on a regular basis and making sure that nothing's going wrong, okay? Appropriate SO2 levels. Use SO2 to control any spoilage microorganisms um, that you may, you may know about, you may not know about. So using appropriate SO2 levels for your wine during storage. No headspace in tanks. So if it is unavoidable and you have to use a tank that you don't, is not quite filled up, make sure that you are um, filling that headspace with either nitrogen or argon. CO2 is another um, gas that can be used. It's a little bit cheaper than nitrogen or argon. Remember though, to be gassing at a regular interval, okay? Those gases are going to be diffusing into the wine. They're going to, um, tank seals aren't perfect. They're going to be diffusing out. Um, so you do need to consistently be, you know, weekly, bi-weekly at least, be checking these tanks that have headspace and regassing them. Remove film yeast. If you see a film yeast, skim it off the top right away. I would definitely check your SO2 levels and make sure that that is in check, um, but get rid of it, okay? Do not mix it in, skim it off, get as much out as, as physically possible. You may wanna filter your wine as well, depending on um, where you're at in the process. Isolate infected barrels. If you find that one of your barrels has acetic acid, do not think, okay, I'm just going to rack everything out and, and rack it together and blend it together. Maybe if it's creeping high, you might want to do that. But, but I highly, highly, highly recommend that that barrel, you figure out your SO2 level, your pH, make sure you know what the pH is to make sure you know how effective your SO2 is, is being. Um, you may want to filter that barrel. If there's a microbial infection, you may need to go down to 0.45 micron. You might, you may, may need to go down to 0.2 micron to get rid of a microbial infection. So make sure that that barrel is dealt with before you blend it into the bigger tank There's uh, or bigger batch. There's no point in giving the entire batch a Brett infection. That's, that's not a good idea. Okay, so deal with the barrel and get it wrapped up and make sure it's um, in a better condition and then blend it with the rest of the batch. Or it may come down to the VA is just too high or uh, the fault, whatever is just too high and you may need to get rid of it. Okay, but don't um, necessarily blend it right away. Okay, so remediation. Um, how can we get rid of uh, acetic acid if it's there? There's very few, there's very few methods to do this. Um, but one thing, if you're, if your acetic acid is creeping, okay, if it's um, creeping and you're post-fermentation already and um, you really got to check your SO2, and I know I've said this several times already, so you need to check your SO2. You may want to lower the pH so that way you don't have to add more SO2. If you low, if you have the opportunity to lower the pH of your wine, your SO2 just might be more effective. Make sure there's charts out there that um, that you can look at to see if at your pH how much SO2 do you actually need. Remember that ethanol does play a role in that. This is just a graph of those charts, um, just because you can see more. So if you had a pH of 3.6 in your wine and you've got an alcohol of 14%, we're gonna be looking at this blue line here, you need at least, um, to really protect your wine, you need at least between 35 and 40 uh, ppm or milligram per liter of free SO2, okay? So 20 is not gonna cut it. I mean, some people have a, a, a standard amount that they like to see. You need to know that pH of your wine to know where your end alcohol to know where your free SO2 needs to be. Okay, so please use all the tools and all the information. Filter. 
if you've got uh if you know it's a spoilage microorganism uh you may want to filter to try and get rid of as much of those microorganisms as possible 0.45 micron filtration is is gonna remove most yeast um it will remove some of the bacteria but um at that point too maybe you want to use some sort of um finding agent to to remove some of that um those as well so just um be aware if you want to for sure remove bacteria you're gonna have to go down to point two and that's um that can be challenging and expensive okay so this is why i say prevention 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 because remediation is not that easy you can blend so if you have a high ph um and you have another wine that is lower ph you can blend those together and, and you can do the math fractionally you will uh should you should end up with um a ph based on or sorry an acetic acid level based on the amount of the two um, in the blend. I would definitely though do, anytime you're gonna blend, I would definitely do a bench trial. Do a bench trial, check the acetic acid level of that bench trial, make sure that the, the sensory wise, that it is what you want for the wine and uh, before just, you know, blending automatically. There is reverse osmosis out there. It's a uh, expensive piece of equipment. I'm not gonna talk about it that much because not many people have um, access to this equipment. I mean, it's tens of thousands of dollars. So they do, it does exist. It probably exists as a mobile unit in some states um, in some places. It, uh, I know we had a unit here in Iowa, but I don't know if it's operational anymore. And so I wouldn't count on reverse osmosis because I don't, um, it's not gonna, it's not gonna fully fix your wine and it could remove other things that, um, uh, aromas and things like that, that you don't necessarily want to remove. So I don't necessarily re uh, recommend counting on reverse osmosis. I would highly recommend being preventative upfront. And learn. Learn, we're all gonna have high acetic acid at some point. Sometimes it just, um, you know, it, it just happens, okay? Even the best winemakers have probably had issues at some point with um, acetic acid creeping. And uh, so what I suggest though, is if it happens, don't let it happen again, okay? Let's learn from our mistakes. Let's um, not make, um, not get sloppy and um, yeah, do things differently next time. Get rid of the equipment that might be, or sanitize the equipment, get rid of the barrels that might be infected, things like that. Okay, so testing, when would I test? Um, this is obviously uh, a lot more than what most wineries are gonna test, but um, I'm giving you what I do here at the Institute when I'm making our commercial batches of wine. So fruit, I'm. I think you can get away with just an aroma check, okay? That's you smelling the fruit, looking at the fruit, making sure it's in good condition. So when do I measure acetic acid? I measure it in the juice before fermentation. I like to have a baseline of where are we really starting in this juice? I measure it directly after post-fermentation. So once I've racked off the wine. Um, I measure it monthly during storage, and I also at the same time measure free SO2 to make sure that those two, um, that acetic acid's not creeping up and that free SO2 isn't falling too low, okay? I measure it immediate post-bottling um, as well. I want to make sure that um, I measure it pre-bottling uh, as well, but I, I measure it immediately post-bottling again to have an idea of where did it start in the bottle, and then at six months and a year, we do do analysis as well of the bottles just to see that everything is, um, is okay as the wine hangs out before being sold. So I bet a lot of people are saying, Aaron, I'm not going to measure this much. This is a lot, of, um, a lot of measurements. I don't have a way of measuring, so I'm sending it to a lab, so that costs money. If you were going to measure it once... My recommendation is post-fermentation, and here's the reasoning. At post-fermentation, you've already had your increase from the Saccharomyces cerevisiae um, or potentially the malolactic bacteria. So you know that should be your baseline. 
Okay, that's your your pre-aging, let's say, baseline. And where things that's where you really want to start protecting your wine. You worked really hard to grow that fruit. You worked really hard to ferment that wine. Now you got to protect it. Okay. Um, so measure it post fermentation. You know where you're starting. And then you should be on a regular basis checking your free SO2. Free SO2 is a lot easier for small wineries to be measuring. I think most people have some sort of setup. Um, and if you don't, I highly recommend you have a setup for free SO2. There's some inexpensive options out there. And, and acetic acid or volatile acidity is not that easy to, to measure. So measure, it at po measure your acetic acid at post-fermentation and then check your free SO2 on a regular basis, I would say monthly. Um, and that should give you an idea, hopefully with your, your own smelling as well, your own sensory evaluation, you can determine if things are going off the rails, okay? If your SO2 uh, for some reason drops like crazy, you better be concerned about spoilage microorganisms, okay? But most of the spoilage microorganisms are very sensitive to SO2. Okay, so keep that level in check. Um, okay, so how do we test for acetic acid or volatile acidity? We can use a cash still. This is a cash still. They are, I did a check last week, um, they are $895 from a, um, a wine and beer um, equipment uh, company. So eight hundred and ninety-five dollars. That's it, that's a lot of money for to to be able to to do one thing. Okay. If you want to know how it works, I'll just briefly describe it here. You the wine goes into this inner chamber. Okay, using this little funnel up here, it goes into this inner chamber, and this is why it's so expensive. It's it's very specialty glassware. Um. So so making this glassware, blowing this glassware is very difficult. So the wine goes into this inner chamber. The outer chamber here. Um is where water goes and it's heated through this coil the water and becomes steam it boils and so the steam enters into the inner chamber and so you need steam you can't just boil wine you need to to take it past that point past that temperature okay and so steam will take the um, the wine over the temperature you need to get that acetic acid to boil off. Acetic acid has a boiling point above water, um, slightly above water. And so you um, so the steam will help drive that acetic acid off and other volatile acids, and it will condense in this condenser. It'll turn back into liquid. Okay, and then you would have a flask at the bottom of this um, at the bottom of this collection tube, and then you titrate it against sodium hydroxide. Okay, so you do need another piece of equipment. You need a burette so that you can titrate the um, the distillate that comes off of here. And then the nice little thing you can suck out very easily the um, uh, the sample and, and do an another sample. So. Um, so that's kind of a slick little way of, of getting the sample out when you're finished. But that's how a cash still essentially works. It's expensive. It's specialty glassware. Um, you do need to be, you know, it's, it's a little fragile. The way that we measure acetic acid at the Institute is with an enzymatic kit and a spectrophotometric method. So what we do is we are making uh, or taking advantage of some um, enzymes and, um, and other reactions and we can measure that on a spectrophotometer. Spectrophotometers are a couple thousand dollars. You can measure quite a few, you can get a kits to measure quite a few things, residual sugar, um, acetic acid, uh, we do malic acid. There's also kits for SO2, there's also kits for ethanol. So there is a whole wide range of enzymatic, um, and yan actually I should say, um, enzymatic kits that you can get to use with a spectrophotometer. Um, they do require other pieces of equipment though, pipettes, pipette tips, um, cuvettes, um, the kits themselves. So there's, there's some other equipment necessary, but this is how we do a lot of our acetic acid analysis at the Institute. 
We could also do HPLC. So HPLC is high performance or high pressure, um, but high performance uh, liquid chromatography. And again, this is a, you know, that tens and tens of thousands of dollars piece of equipment. Um, we use it a lot for research, but what we can do is we can separate out all of the acids. So we can actually get a profile of, this isn't from our actual HPLC, it's just an example, but you can get tartaric separated from citric, separated from malic. So, um, uh, we could separate out acetic acid and we can quantify it that way. So at this point, this is where I would say that it can be very difficult for small wineries to measure acetic acid. The Institute is here. Okay. The, um, we have a service lab. Uh, we run acetic acid analysis quite often. Um, and so I would highly recommend, you know, reaching out to us using our analytical lab services, uh, especially when, you know, it could be challenging for small wineries to be, um, or, or other labs that are in your area. There's probably people watching this that aren't necessarily in the Midwest, but, um, but we can serve a whole range of people. So you don't have to be from the Midwest for us to help you out. Um, but yeah, please contact us. Our contact information is uh, in the video description down below, and we can help you measure your acetic acid um, to pre be preventative. That's what we're hoping to get to. We want people to be preventative and um, so that we're not always seeing acetic acid problems. Um, so with that, um, I would like to thank you all for uh, listening to this presentation. 